Um, so anyway, uh, back in when I was in college at Wright State, um, it was when I was first started to seek God. And the reasoning that I started to seek the Lord God was largely for emotional reasons. I was going through some mental difficulties, some emotional difficulties, and I started to pray to God. I started to seek his comfort. But of course, over the years, Sometimes our feelings, our emotions don't always tell us that God is there with us. When everything around us is falling apart, sometimes we have this blockage that ceases, that wants to put doubts in our mind. And so what I've found is that over these years with all the difficulties that we face is that sometimes what really helps root our faith into Christ are the proofs of God, the evidence of God that not only does he exist, but that he is also the God of Jesus Christ. Because as we know, there are many different religions that exist in this world, you know, of Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, all these different religions, and they all point to a God. But the simple truth of it is that God is only God if he has created everything. So there can only be one true God. But the question now is, which God is it? That's the dilemma that so many people face. And what we will be seeing today, what I hope and pray that we see today, is that not only do we have a God who exists, our God is the God of Jesus Christ. Someone who we can put our faith into and we can trust wholeheartedly that not only exists, but he is the one and true God that we have. And so what we're going to be doing today and also next Sunday, we're going to be looking at the evidences of God. And there are honestly a lot of proofs that God exists. And there's a lot of proofs that God exists as the God of Jesus Christ. There are, it's overwhelming the evidence that it exists for his being. We are only going to look at a couple of those. I'm sure you guys all appreciate that. We're actually going to be looking at the, the prophecies that God has placed in the Old Testament regarding Jesus Christ. But we have to come to some sort of understanding on what is a prophecy. Because we hear, even today, we hear people making predictions about the future. We hear people saying, in such and such time, this will happen. Question is, is it real? Is it true? We can't tell because we're living in the current and the prophecy regards the future. So how do we know that a real prophecy is a real prophecy? Well, actually, the Israelites asked the very same question back with, in the times of Moses. They asked Moses, what is a real prophecy? How do we know it's a real prophecy? And God answered that. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, it lays out what makes a real prophecy. The first criteria for a prophecy is that it has to be done in the name of the Lord. There is no one on this earth who knows the future except for God. God is the only one who knows the future, and he is the only one who can actually tell the future because he has that power as being an omnipotent God, a God who exists in all place at all time. Now, the issue that we might face with this is that I could say right now, in the name of the Lord, the Bengals will win today. He told me. There's an issue with this, isn't there? I said it. It doesn't mean it's true. I said it, but that doesn't mean that God actually told me. Just, I hope, but it's doubtful, to be honest. And so God actually answers that question because it's an issue, and God in his infinite wisdom knew that that was going to be an issue. And so he added a second criteria to this. It has to be true in every detail, down to the smallest bit. God's prophecies are not general and vague. 
God's prophecies are actually very specific and detailed. It would be almost like as if we were talking about the Bengals, like God's prophecies would look something like the Bengals will win today. Burrow will have 238 yards passing. He will have two interceptions. Rushing yards will be 104. It gets down into details with his prophecies. And if just one itty bitty part of that prophecy is wrong, it's not a real prophecy. If Burrow threw a little bit more yardage, not a real prophecy. That's how specific God gets with his prophecies. And that's why they're so important for when we come to an understanding that God exists and that God is the God of Jesus Christ. It's why these prophecies are so important. Because there's no real explanation on that merit. There is no way someone can make these kinds of prophecies without there being a God and without him being the God of Jesus Christ. And we'll see that. And fun fact, I know Gladys enjoyed this earlier today. There are over 300 prophecies on Jesus Christ. Over 300 prophecies on Jesus Christ. And um, there was a math, math statistician, statistician guy. Uh, but he came up with the probability that all these prophecies would be fulfilled in one person. And he found that the number was 11 trillions, not like 11 trillion, but like a trillion and another trillion and another trillion. I don't even know what number that is, to be honest. Kurt, I know you're good with math. What is that? Okay. <laughs> it's a huge amount, way more than any amount of people has existed on this earth. So the probability that these prophecies being fulfilled, near impossible but they happened. Why? Because God is in control and God exists and he is the God of Jesus Christ. Now, when I was doing my studies on prophecies, um, I, I came to an observation. There's nothing in scripture that says exactly what I'm about to say. So please bear with me on that. But what I found is that when it comes to prophecies, there, there appear to be two different types of prophecies. There are tangible prophecies. And what tangible means is that it's something physical, it's something concrete, it's something real. So an example of a tangible prophecy is like, where is Jesus going to be born? Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a physical place. It truly exists. Mary was able to literally have Jesus in Bethlehem. And then there are also intangible prophecies, which are not physical. They are, it's more like my personality. You can't touch my personality. It's not quote unquote real. It's more of like an abstract, it's more conceptual. And there appear to be those different kinds of prophecies within scripture. Today, we're going to be looking at just a couple intangible prophecies. So the prophecies that are more characteristics, more attributes of God and Jesus Christ. Next week, we'll look more at tangible prophecies. And so what we're going to look at today is out of the book of Matthew. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 13. And there are a couple of prophecies in Matthew chapter 13. And when we look at this chapter, what this whole chapter is about are parables. Jesus speaks in parables throughout this whole chapter. And that's actually what these prophecies are going to be regarding. And so the first um, prophecy that we're going to look at teaches us how Jesus is going to teach. So we're going to be looking at how Jesus taught to the people and what we find in this is in Matthew chapter 13, verses 34 to 35. After Jesus gave a parable and then he gave an explanation on that parable, he gave another parable. He then comes to 34, 35, which, the, which says all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. And he did not speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill 
what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. Very specific. And then it, the rest of the verse goes on to say, I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Now that second part to that verse we'll get into later on. We're going to focus right now on the fact that Jesus taught in parables. Now, parables are just comparisons. We use parables actually quite frequently with our everyday talk. It's just comparing from one thing to another. An example of a parable is, a, is if saying someone is as strong as an ox. Is the person literally as strong as an ox? No, but they're just making the comparison that the person is as strong as an ox. That they're incredibly strong. And that's all a parable really is. It's a comparison. Um, another word that they use for parables are proverbs. And we've heard proverbs before those old, what are they called? Old wives tales, that kind of thing. And so we live in a world that we speak with parables. We speak with comparisons. And so the question is, is, well, does that really mean that Jesus is Jesus and that God exists? Because we all speak in parables. And that's a valid point. But the thing is, is with this prophecy, it's a really interesting, comes from a very interesting prophecy. It comes out of Psalms, Psalm 78. And in Psalm 78, what we witness, it's kind of a long chapter, but the psalmist of that particular psalm wrote also kind of in parables. But when we look at the entirety of Psalm 78, we see a lot of interesting comparisons. I had fun with that. A lot of interesting comparisons between Psalm 78 and Jesus Christ in its entirety. So as we look at Psalm 78, what the psalmist writes, he begins it by saying, uh, I will speak in parables and I will utter things hidden since the foundations of the world or some sort of translation like that. The rest of Psalm 78, the psalmist writes first off that God performed miracles in front of the Israelites. That God showed wonders and miracles in front of the Jewish peoples, such as splitting the Red Sea, Moses striking a rock and water gushing out. And we see these miracles take place that happened in front of the Israelite people. When if we know our Old Testament history, the Israelite people rebelled. They saw these wonders, they saw the miracles, and they rebelled against God. But God, the psalmist writes that God looked upon them with compassion. He said, they are a people of flesh. I will forgive them. Even though they rebel against me, I will rebel. I will forgive against. I will forgive their sin. And of course, whenever we have a broken issue, a sin problem of any sort, God also is promised in Psalms to provide a shepherd. And as we read this morning in Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd. Now, when we compare this, all these attributes of God that corresponded to the Israelite people, and we look at Jesus Christ. We look at Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ performed miracles, did he not? He did. He healed people. He rose people from the dead. He performed miracles right in front of people's eyes. And what did the people do? They rebelled against Jesus Christ. They watched these miracles happen with their very eyes. And at one time, they even said he was a demonic. And Jesus, of course, rebuked that. But we start seeing these connections between Psalm 78 and Jesus Christ. You know, that... Um, Jesus performed miracles. The people rebelled against God. And then we have God's forgiveness. And then we come to an understanding of Jesus on the cross. 
Jesus did not die, quote unquote, for the righteous. Jesus died for the very people who rebelled against him. He died so that we could be forgiven. He died so that we can enter the kingdom of heaven. Same story in Psalm 78. And then, of course, it concludes with the fact that Jesus is our shepherd. He is our shepherd. He watches over us. He protects us. He nurtures us. And these parables that we witness that Jesus refers to in Matthew chapter 13 and throughout Scripture, they're not just merely comparisons. Because anyone, like I said before, can make a comparison. The comparisons that Jesus was referring to, though, was a comparison between the physical and the spiritual. Just for an instance, the very first parable that he gives in Matthew chapter 13 is on sowing seed. And he goes out and he explains, he says, yep, there was a farmer or someone. He dropped seed. It went on the roadside. The birds came and devoured it. And then the holy seed or the seed went in the soil with a whole bunch of rocks in there. The root barely went down. The sun scorched the root. And then you have the next part. The seed went got planted, but then weeds and thorns and briars, it just overwhelmed the seed, and the seed died. But then you have at the very end that the seed went in the ground. It got planted, the root went far down, and it produced a harvest. Jesus is one great farmer, because I'm sure that's what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about farming. He was talking about the spiritual realm. He was talking about the spiritual realm. And this is also what I refer to in the second part to that, to that verse. When Jesus says, I will utter hard sayings, or I will utter dark sayings, or I will, what is the actual wording? I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Not only... Do we have a prophecy on how Jesus is going to teach? We have a prophecy on what Jesus will teach. Te Jesus's mission, one of his missions, was to teach about the kingdom of heaven. Now, when we look at that verse alone, I will utter hard sayings or I will utter hidden things since the foundation of the world. You might be asking me, like, where did you get that from? It doesn't say kingdom of heaven anywhere in there. But when we look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 11, this was after Jesus gave his first parable. The disciples asked Jesus, why are you speaking in parables? And Jesus answered, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That's why Jesus was teaching in parables, was to teach about the kingdom of heaven. And when we look at the kingdom of heaven, it was hidden for a very long time. Ever since Adam and Eve, all the way up until Jesus Christ, the kingdom of heaven, in a lot of ways, was concealed. It was a mystery. And the reason that it was concealed, the reason it was a mystery, was because the Israelite peoples were chosen to proclaim the word of God. But this is the only thing. The Israelite people were given the law. They were given the commands of God. You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not lie, not lie et cetera, et cetera. Here's the thing. To enter into the kingdom of heaven, it's not by the law. Because if we try to get into the kingdom of heaven by the law, we will all fall short. Because we've all violated the law at some point in our life. And that is why it is the mystery of the kingdom of heaven is revealed at that time because Jesus did not die on the cross yet. God's grace was not richly bestowed upon not only the Jews, the whole world. Because that was also the belief at that time by the Israelites 
that God's chosen people were the Israelites and only the Israelites. That was not the plan in the beginning at all. God was using the Israelite nation to get his word out there just so that the entire world can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus came to do with his parables. He came to further reveal the mystery of this kingdom. And so what we find, the question is, are we a part of it? I've mentioned before that it's by God's grace. I also mentioned before that there's another prophecy we would be looking at. And this prophecy, what it has to refer to is the people's acceptance and rejection of the kingdom of heaven. It was prophesied the people's response to the teaching of Jesus Christ. To give you context before we look at this, this prophecy, actually, I'll go ahead and read Matthew chapter 13, verse 14 to 15. Actually, I'll read from verse 11. So it says, Jesus answered them after he gave um, the disciples a parable and the people a parable. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive, for the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Now this passage in Scripture from Isaiah, and also here, and then also in Acts, has created a lot of controversy amongst biblical scholars. Because what some people find that passage to mean is that God purposely is keeping the kingdom of heaven away from a certain group of people. That he is causing people to have a hard heart. He is causing people to not accept the kingdom of heaven. That's not what's being said here at all. What's being said is the simple matter of fact that people will accept the kingdom and people will reject it. It's just the simple truth of the matter. And so when we look at the context of Isaiah chapter 6. I love this story. I love this story. I get bouncy on this one a little bit. So what happens with Isaiah is that he has this vision. So picture this. It's only Isaiah. And then he sees God. He's lofty and exalted. And there are these seraphim. And these seraphim are divine creatures. They have six wings. They cover their, their faces. They cover their feet. And they can fly. So we have Isaiah, God, and the seraphim. And the seraphim were chanting, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. May his earth fill, be filled with his glory. When Isaiah saw this, he was terrified. He was in the presence of the holy God. And Isaiah said himself, I am ruined. Because, Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I belong to a nation of unclean lips. Basically, he's saying, I am a sinner, and my entire nation is a, is a sinful people. How can I be in your presence? You are a holy and righteous God, and I am a sinner. How can I be in front of you right now? With that, one of the seraphim, they took a hot burning coal, and they took it to Isaiah, and they, he opened his mouth, and they stuck the coal in his mouth. 
And the seraphim told Isaiah, you now have clean lips. You are forgiven. God then declares, he asks, who shall I send? Now, this is the funny part with this story. Isaiah is the only one here other than the seraphim and God. And Isaiah is basically, I just picture Isaiah like a five-year-old child at school. Pick me! I want to go! Pick me! I want to go! Because God is asking for a messenger. And Isaiah is just, you forgave me, I am ready to go. Let's do this. Before he was forgiven, he was ruined. Now he's able to be in the presence of God. Isaiah then asks, and so that's when we then get the prophecy of Isaiah. Because God then told him to tell this message. Go on telling them that they're going to be hearing, but not perceiving and the rest of that. Isaiah then asks God, how long? How long shall I proclaim this message? God says, till everything is destroyed. He said, don't worry, there'll be a tenth portion remaining of it. The remnant, his chosen people. But the promise to Isaiah was, go and proclaim this message until everything is over. Don't stop giving up. So when we take that context and look at the parables that Jesus was speaking about, and I encourage each and every one of us to look at Matthew 13 and look at the parables, is that what we see in it, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> hooray, hooray. Is that simply we will continue to proclaim this message on the kingdom of heaven? There will be people who will accept it. And let's just stop there right now. People will accept it. We don't know who will. So we just have to keep saying it and proclaiming the gospel. Don't forget, though, that there will be a people who will reject it. And when it comes to rejection, we see persecution and anger, rebellion. We have the instance of the missionaries from Haiti being kidnapped. And what I hope that we see in all of this is that the prophecies that God gave concerning Jesus Christ, he even gave prophecies on how Jesus would teach. He gave prophecies on what Jesus would talk about within those parables. And then he gave us a prophecy that the people will not understand it. And of course, there will be those critics out there who will look at this and be like, well, others can speak in parables. Others can talk about the kingdom. Of course, people reject. People like to reject things. Next week, we are going to be talking about a prophecy no critic has been able to deny. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. 